Conductor Pro Basics. This tutorial will cover the fundamentals of working within Conductor Pro to produce shows for deployment to Pro Commander, Pro IO, and BrainSalt server devices. If your project consists of external Vagal hardware devices, it is highly recommended you first view the Vagal Device Configuration and Hardware Configurator tutorial videos and familiarize yourself with the basic connection steps required for the hardware. Let's begin with a default layout within Conductor Pro 2.0 or newer. To make sure that you are within the default layout, navigate to View, Workspace, and Reset Default Layout. If this option is grayed out, that means that you are currently within the factory default setup. Your screen should look like this with a new show and nothing within the layout. The first thing we want to do is add some devices to our setup. If you've previously connected to a Pro Commander or Pro IO, that will show up within the Discover Devices window. If this is your first time or you'd like to refresh, press the Discover Devices tab. This will search for any devices connected over Ethernet, Serial, USB, or if you've selected it, the ArtNet protocol. This video will focus on devices that are branded Waggle and have either a Pro Commander or Pro IO designation. Once I've selected the Pro Commander 2, I can set up a lot of default inputs, outputs, serial baud rates, DMX settings, as well as IP, subnet, and port settings. Assuming that I'm within the same IP range and subnet as my computer, this IP address will be listed in white. If my Pro Commander was on a different subnet, in this case, I've just changed it to 192.0.0.101 rather than the factory default of 10.0.0.101. You'll notice that the only thing I can do is update my IP and subnet mask. So if I were to come in here and enter 10.0.0.101, update IP and subnet mask, it's going to reboot and rediscover. And now I've brought my Pro Commander 2 remotely into the same subnet and IP range as my PC. Waggle Hardware Configurator also allows this to be done over the MAC address located on the sticker below your Pro Commander. Any of these options allow you to bring the Pro Commander within the range of the IP and subnet that your computer is currently set to. This is required to make a full connection for programming. Additionally, while certain Pro IO modules can be programmed over serial or USB, a Pro Commander can only be programmed in real time over a network connection. Once you've connected, you'll have controls for DMX, audio, inputs and outputs, serial port, show control, and variables. This does mimic, for the large part, what is available in Waggle Hardware Configurator. For more information on how to set up a device or initial settings with Waggle Hardware Configurator for Mac or PC, please watch the video related to this subject matter. From this screen, however, we do often recommend checking outputs that are sent to the Pro Commander. You'll see this on the screen of the Pro Commander itself as well as verifying your inputs should you have any panel I.O. or push buttons for show starts. Once we're sure that the Pro Commander 2 is set up correctly, let's right click on the device or devices and hit Add to Timeline. This will snap us back to the Timeline view and add a Pro Commander as a device under the New Show tab. Once I have a Pro Commander added, this is my container for the hardware I.O. of this actual show. This is set to an IP and port of 10.0.0.101.55.55. If this changes at any time within my show setup, I can always edit this without going back to the Discover devices. I could also change the name and set up a variety of other ease-in and DMX related options that are global to the Pro Commander hardware. For this application, we don't need to do anything other than add an audio track and five digital IOs. I'll right click on the Pro Commander, I can do that either in the layout or in the track, and I'm going to add a channel and an audio channel. I'm going to go back and add a channel range, digital, and the amount of channels set to 5. I can label these either at the timeline itself or down in the layout tab. We'll add eyes left. Eyes right and head nod. Quite the advanced character with five moves. From this location, I can now start adding data immediately to my digital channels. Wherever I click above 50%, a high point is added, and wherever I click below 50%, a low point is added. 
Immediately I can start editing these points by simply clicking and dragging within the timeline the highlighted point. There is no offline or online mode within Conductor Pro. Everything is an online and real-time application. This means if I want to select all of these and slide them left or right, this data moves in real time in my timeline. If my time indicator is just before one minute and my data is now moved after it, this will go immediately low. If I want to delete a large section, I can highlight and either press the delete key on my keyboard or select the deleted points. These are immediately removed from the timeline. Let's talk for a moment about undo and levels of undo. I just made a bunch of changes to my editing and I want to undo those. By hitting Ctrl Z or using this undo button at the top, I can step backwards in time. You'll see that all my changes are reverting one at a time. One very unique feature about Conductor Pro is that each of these undos and redos are set up in steps. This is very helpful for animation and editing because I can step backwards from a single step or a multitude of steps within this list. Let's say I want to go all the way back. I stepped all the way back and actually removed all those tracks. Well, that was a mistake. I don't want to do that. Let's go ahead and redo everything down to the point change and the selection of that mouth move. So this was the original data that I started with before I began my editing. This is very helpful, particularly when we get into animated data that is brought in from a real-time recording source. If we click on the track header, we can change the output here as well. We can change the actual device address that the Pro Commander sends this data from. This means that if I originally had my mouth move set up on output 1 and I wanted to move this to 8 or 9 or 10, that would be just a simple drop-down menu. We'll get into value source of reference, self, and generated data later, but for the most part, self just means that track here will output for digital output 1. Of course, we can invert the data here or in the hardware itself, and this is more of an advanced feature if you actually wanted to program from 0 to 100, but have that be 100 to 0. Looking back at the track, I also have send minimum value, send default value, and send maximum value. For a digital output, we can only send minimum, which is 0, and maximum, which is 100, but when we get into analog data and ease in, default value will help take us to a home or safe position as required. You'll notice if I press send maximum value, my Pro Commander will set to 100%. As we navigate through the track, you'll see that go to one or zero for digital, but up to 65,000 if this was an analog numeric channel, 16 bit. This also shows 100% for 100% of the value. Now we can add audio and other devices to this Pro Commander. Let's take a look at what it looks like to add an audio file. Once we've selected and imported our file, you'll notice that it shows up here in the Audio Resources tab. We can simply then drag the file from the Audio Resources tab to the point in the timeline where we want the file to be placed. On a Pro Commander device, notice that we cannot go before zero. We must start at zero, zero in order for that to be exported to the SD flashcard. Again, if I click on the header for the track, it will allow me to both label the track as well as set the output for the actual file itself. On a Pro Commander 2, we only have the ability to export to stereo, so the only thing we can really do here is swap left and right. If this was a Pro Commander PHX or a Pro Commander LX, we would be able to export those to a multitude of different channel configurations, including downmix. If we had more than one audio file, we can also mix down multiple audio files and set their levels to the same track and have those merged on export. We'll deal with this later in the audio configuration video that you can find as well on this website. Once I have this audio track and some programming in my system, so let's actually throw a few more pieces of data in the timeline here. I have a more or less complete timeline that I can start to play with and possibly export to my show control device. If I hit the play up top, you'll notice that I not only get the audio playback, but I'm going to start to see some high and low variations in my outputs. This will jump to 100. As we get to this track, this will also jump to 100. And we'll see this information show up on the Pro Commander 2's display as well. At the top of the, of the conductor timeline, we have a couple different buttons here. All of these are, are hover over enabled so that if you forget what they do or you forget the keyboard shortcut, the default keyboard shortcut that is, you can simply click up here 
to see how to activate them. This will take us back to zero, zero. This will take us to the previous point. That's the point of animation in the timeline. This will set a locator to a marker, which we'll deal with markers later. This will play the timeline. This will jump us forward to the next marker, and this will move the marker, the locator to the next animation point in the timeline. When we get into markers, when we get into advanced setup of the timeline, there are other ways for, we, for us to, to set up how we get around in the actual show playback. For now, the simplest way is to grab the yellow marker and move us back and forth in the timeline. If we want to start at one minute, we can simply drag the timeline to this point, and you'll notice that this red marker stays behind. If we want to get back to one minute, but not the beginning of the timeline, we can simply stop the timeline by pressing space or the stop bar and hit control space to jump us back to where that red marker was. Now, if I were to hit space again and stop and hit space again, that marker moves forward. So note that only hitting space once allows us to repeat from that beginning time. If we want to set a range, a range to work with for either programming or playback, we can hit Alt Space when we get to that new endpoint. Now, this particular setup will allow me to go in between these two markers by just using Control Space to return to the first marker. And of course, it will stop and repeat back to the first starting point after it hits that end marker. We can also right click sorry, left click on the stop marker here at one minute and 10 seconds. And as we get to that marker, it will automatically loop. This is helpful for previewing a section of animation without actually really getting into markers or loop setups or things that are more complicated. Once I want to stop this loop, I simply left click and then hit my space bar again. and right click to get rid of the shading inside this particular marker. If this marker is shaded, or if the marker up front here is shaded, you can right click to either select or unselect this shading. The shading prevents the markers from being moved. This means that once I have both markers shaded, this will repeat indefinitely and these track markers are locked. We've looked at how to use play range markers to set a beginning, end, and loop point for the cursor within the timeline. There is an extended functionality, however, using interactive markers directly below the timeline. A new timeline and conductor will come default with the 00, zero marker. At any other point in the timeline, you can double click to create a marker. The marker will do a number of things. Over in the properties, we can label this and say character one start for marker two, character one stop, and loop points. To create these, all I'm doing is double clicking, as you can see with the blue arrows, which surround the mouse click. These markers can be adjusted if I couldn't get exactly the frame I wanted, just by entering the number point. Those will move forward. And I can also show a vertical line for any of these to mark where they would fall in the timeline. This is very helpful when you're programming so you know exactly where you fit in the show. Dash style can be solid. or any of the pulses, as you can see. We can also use a custom color from either the color picker or the predefined list. So as you can see here, very rapidly, we've created 00, zero character one start, and character one stop. Now, not only do these provide visual markers, but they can actually provide, uh, not only do these provide visual markers, but they can also provide action steps for the timeline. Currently, they're set to ignore by default, but for example, I could set character one start to punch in, character one stop to punch out. When we get into real-time recording and recording groups, this would automatically enable record or disable record for that particular character through assignments in the recording group. These are set to global currently, and we'll start the recording process at character one start, and character one stop will act as a punch out. If we go down to loop point and select this marker, I'll create a jump from the target to zero, 00. So not using the play range, I've created a loop point, which will jump back to zero, 00 and continue rolling the timeline. 
What this does is give me a pre-roll up until the point character one will start recording, and character two will stop far, or character one rather will stop recording not too long after that. If I jump forward, you'll see this punch in. So you see we can have some basic marker functionality. At the bottom of the screen you'll notice that the colors do reflect in this, the macro scrub bar that allows us to move in and out as well as show you the function if there is a function applied. You can also use this icon on the far right to create a marker at the specific timeline point where it's created. This gives you the accuracy if you are following SMPTE commands or something from an external source without having to hunt and peck on the timeline. Once that marker is created, all of the things we've currently discussed can be applied to provide actions, labels, or colors. As we get marks in the timeline, you'll also notice that the properties apply to not only the track header, but also individual elements that are selected within Conductor. Here, I can move this point around by simply typing in a numeric value. You'll notice this extends, and the track duration does not change, but the point and the clip here that we have set will actually extend. We can also mute, lock, and unlock, or pin each of these tracks themselves. In order to lock a track, this means that it cannot be recorded or modified, but it can be played back. We simply select the bullseye looking indicator here on the track itself. Snapping can also be disabled or enabled to the right of this particular bullseye, or we can pin a track to the top. We'll get into what the pins actually can offer us in addition for editing purposes, but for now we can see that we can just focus, just like we did with the filter, on the eye blink and the audio channel by pinning the track. Global unpin is available at the top, and again we'll revisit what this pinning actually means. There are two other tracks now that we have digital and audio set up that we like to look at in this basic tutorial and that would be analog and command channels. Again on the Pro Commander 2 I want to add a single analog channel so I'll add that to the bottom and an additional command channel. The command channel most importantly is how we would actually develop any sort of logic within our Pro Commander show that would be played back on the SD card. Without getting into extended logic, we can do a simple restart command at the end of the timeline. Assuming this show is show 3, we can restart that show 3 either by uh, selecting a command list, which we'll talk about later, or just typing in the raw ASCII command. We can test this command and find out that the Pro Commander would actually restart the timeline if there was a card in place. More on this later as we get into advanced logic and programming. With the analog data, we have the ability to either record this like the digitals from an external input, or we can simply choose the pencil tool and draw in our analog data. This analog data can be edited with the pencil, as well as freeform created and mixed with data on the timeline. Additionally, just like with digitals, we can select and modify a group or range of analogs directly from the timeline. There is no external editor or online or offline mode. Everything is considered real-time in Conductor, and as you edit these points or selections, they will move in sync with the actual uh, output on the Pro Commander. If we need extended options on either analog or digital, you can go down by the track header and select points. We can invert the value, we can scale, we can shift, we can change interpolations, or we can optimize the curve. These will be covered extensively in the later video on extended editing. A few more things that are worth noting is that we can zoom in, we can zoom out, we can lock editing of horizontal movements. So let's take a look at that for analog. This means that I can only move left and right, or we can lock for vertical. This means I can only move up and down, but I cannot shift that position in time. As I'm hovering over each of these, you'll notice there are keyboard shortcuts in place vertical, horizontal, F for freehand. However, all of these are set up under the Shortcuts tab under Tools. Within this window, I can reconfigure any of the default shortcuts that are used for keyboard commands to adjust my layout or viewpoint within Conductor. The simplest of these is, of course, Zoom In. Most programs use the plus key and the minus key to set a Zoom In or Zoom Out. These can be cleared individually at any point, or you can reset them to the default. 
Once you have a set list of configuration shortcuts, you can also import and export those to travel with you from PC to PC. Like elsewhere in the software, we can filter by selecting this filter bar up at the top. Once we have these set up the way we want them, of course we can exit this and go back to our conductor timeline, and I'm pressing the plus key and the minus key to move in and out of the timeline. The final tab we'll look at in this basic configuration video is found under Tools and Settings. Settings is the global configuration that you can apply to any of your conductor timelines. Basic application settings, artnet settings, audio, channel, default values, export, logs, passive and active mode for SMPTE timecode, as well as startup and shutdown and user interface preferences are all found here. More will be covered in depth as we cover each of these sections in later videos. You may want to, however, immediately change your priority level from normal to highest if your computer is a i5 or better or a dual core or quad core machine. This concludes the basic setup for a Conductor Pro timeline using a Wagle Pro Commander or Pro IO device. For more information, please watch any of the following videos or visit us at faq.wagle.support.